Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Bob Copas, and he's in Amsterdam, and he's a near-death re near death experience researcher. And what's really interesting to me is that he is a retired banker, so I'm really curious how that happened. So, hi, Bob. Hi. Nice to be on your show. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, I'm so interested in everything about near-death experiences, so I'm really Excited to hear what you have to teach us and what you've learned from your studies and, and how you got into this being a banker. You're curious about that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I became banker after I did my study. And during my study, I already was spiritually interested. So uh, I became interested before I became a banker. But I, I did my study on economics uh, in Amsterdam or in, in Groningen. That's a little, it's a big town in up north in the Netherlands. And it shows you that even economists can be spiritually interested. Uh, so, but then uh, it really started with uh, being interested in near-death experiences when I read the book by uh, Raymond Moody, um, uh, Life After Life. And because in the book, there is um, a story of a woman who had her near-death experience uh, and uh, a life review in her, her near-death experience. And during that, uh, she said uh, she saw everything she did during her life, also the not so very nice things, and uh, she said, there was no one judging me. And you have to know that I was raised Roman Catholic uh, with um, uh, hell and purgatory. And if you're very nice, you go to heaven, otherwise to purgatory or maybe even to hell. And I never liked that story uh, because, um, yeah, why would people, need, even if they're bad, why would they have to be in hell forever? So, and, that, and when I read that by her, when she said that, and I thought, well, that's correct. Because you see your own whole life in the presence of this light that is unconditional love. And you see what all your mistakes are. And, and you, you judge yourself. If someone is there to judge, then it's yourself. You don't need... An other one like Jesus or, or God or so to to judge you, you can do it yourself. Being present in the the unconditional love, you, you you it shines on every little detail you did in your life, and you cannot hide anything. And there's no punishment. There is only unconditional love, and that's one of the other things that I thought was so important. That's unconditional love, and and people say even that term is not adequate to, to convey what is the real thing. And you have to consider what is unconditional, which means there are no conditions. You, actually, you can do whatever you want to do. You can wear your hair in the way you want to have it. You can go to church or to the mosque. You don't have to go to church or mosque. You don't have to pray. You can even be bad. Uh, and I always tell people, think of someone you really don't like. Uh, there's always someone <laughs> around you or maybe a politician, you don't know. But even those people uh, are unconditionally loved. Uh, and that's that's what I just repeat what and the ears say. And that's this is consistent what and the ears say. So that's very important. So it's consistent what in the ears say that we can be bad. No, it's not that you can be bad. It's, it is that um, there is always love for you, uh, whatever you do. It's, it's like um, a father or, the, or a mother who is uh, still loving the child, even if the child did bad things. And when you, uh, that's another thing. When people are uh, in their near-death experience and they see their life passing by them, and they see what they did that was not very nice. They don't see it uh, as, a, as an onlooker. It's, they also see it as if they are that other person. Now, imagine you, you do something not very nice to uh, someone. Uh, and in your life review, you will be able to feel what that other person felt. And that's, that's very direct. I mean, you are that other person. 
I can I can give you a nice example if if you'd like to hear that I, from I have uh, one running through my head. I'm just wondering so because I've heard what you're saying before on NDEs of life reviews and they experience mm. what and I'm just and I and I've had two NDEs myself and I kind of have a little little knowledge, but um of experience. But I just a vision just flashed in my mind. You're saying that I thought of okay, so these women they go in, they have these abortions. And the baby is, you know, burned through the medication the inside out. They have their legs and arms pulled off. Like, I mean, what we're talking about, the near-death experiences, which a lot of near-death experience uh, researchers are pro-choice, but I'm thinking, do they understand what they're saying? Because they would, in, in this theory, they would feel what, they put that child through by making that decision. They would feel the poison. They would feel the scissors. They would feel their arms and limbs being pulled off without any numbing medication or anything. They would know what it's like to die alone in a bloody trash can heaped with other screaming babies. Do you know what I mean? It's just a vision I got through because that's just where my mind went. But <laughs> well, but if, yet, if you but yet, we, it's okay. Do you know it, it does? Would they still love us? We do things bad, you know. And, and, but that's the case. They still love us, or they. And they'll be like, okay, if my life. daughter did that. Yes, I still love my daughter, yes. but my daughter will experience what she put that child through on the other side, possibly. Yeah, if, if you want to put it like that, you can, you that that's the whole point. You can feel whatever you did to anyone, nice things or or less nice things, uh, as if you are that other person. Now, there's another thing that's very important that I learned from Andy Ears. Uh, and you have to know that I spoke to uh, hundreds of those uh, people uh, and read so many stories of uh, Andy Ears. Uh, the the other thing is that you um, that th the words like bad and good are are of the earth. It it has no meaning on the other side. There is a lot of morality around uh, good and bad here because we put all kinds of labels on it, either from our religion or from our upbringing. But morality changes over time, and what what is on the other side that's only there's only love. There's um, the feeling that there is that that, that you are accepted as you are, uh, even the people that you really don't feel that deserve love or acceptance. Also, they no one is left out. That's that's the thing that I understood from all my talks uh, to so many end years okay because uh, that's even, not even the people who who do abortions uh, or do uh, uh, kill each other in the war in ukraine uh, for instance that's those things are horrible too anything is uh, like that is horrible and and there is always uh, unconditional love for anyone it just seems like that to make these kind of statements based on so many indie ears, it's like, okay, I've researched these indie ears because I've seen this a lot, actually. I even see it in indie groups and they'll say they're like self-proclaimed researchers, not haven't wrote a book or done, actually done studies like you, but, and they'll say, so therefore, um, you know, we all go to heaven. We all enjoy the afterlife. Like there is no hell. And so it becomes a new religion that mm -hmm. that kind of leaves the Christians, the Catholics and things out of this religion because they're not going to buy into this. They're not going to buy into a theory that um, near death experiencers show that there's no good or bad on Earth. Um, well, the, on Earth, there is good and bad because we put those words on on any of those actions but on the other side well I, I can't I can only say what I hear from end years and there's consistent talk about um, uh, words of good and bad are of the earth um, and there is uh, unconditional acceptance and love for for people whatever they did uh, um, and even if if uh, from a, a religious point of view, uh, someone did something wrong, even then there is unconditional love. And I have to say that uh, another thing that I get from Andy Ears is that the real things, so the, the real 
light there is uh, and the real other side when we once we die that that is much much bigger than any single religion being a muslim religion or a hindu or christian or judaistic or buddhist anything is it is bigger than any of those what do you mean the light's bigger than any religion the, the real thing uh, so where we will go is bigger than any religion. Uh, religions are uh, partly also made by people uh, and maybe for a, a big extent. Um, and it's it's made over time, especially by men, I think. Um, and the real thing, once we go to the other side, when we die, we will experience unconditional love, uh, and acceptance of everyone of, for whatever they did. And that's not what is said in uh, many religions. So what I say is that the real thing is bigger than any one religion. It okay. surpasses anything. Because I was in the bright white light and God was there and Jesus was there and angels were there. True. I, there are um, many people that see Jesus uh, or Mary um, and God is seen. Um, if there are even people that speak with God. Um, but there's also religious figures from other religions that are being seen, like from Hindu background or from uh, the Muslim background. Uh, there are people that uh, that are in the NDEs that people that the NDEs see and get to speak. So that's true. It's it's also partly culturally uh, colored and NDE is culturally colored. So if you the religion is there. I mean, our religion no, that we carry is there. No, that, I think it's, that's what I say. The, the real thing surpasses any religion. You, you will understand that it's, that the real thing is much, much bigger than any one religion. That's what I try to say. Because okay, so what's the real thing? Also, sorry? What's the real thing? You're saying the real thing. I'm not sure what you mean. The real thing is um, what people see uh, when they go uh, and have their near-death experience, and that's the light. Uh, that's the conversations with uh, the light or God or Allah or whatever they uh, call this. Um, and the feeling they have there about the unconditional love. Uh, also, people really say that... Um, the religion they adhered to is is not anything that they uh, really want to adhere to later on. People become more are less religious after their NDE. That's that's a fact, um, and they they become more spiritual, uh, or they are more interested in learning about other religions. Uh, so they venture out. They they look over the borders that people have made on Earth. Because they they know that on the other side there are no borders. There's there's a total freedom. Is uh, there's no time there. There's no space there. The place is something that is not really uh, a boundary anymore. And time is no boundary either. So you can Thanks. access any any little uh, any period in time in history. That's uh, that's the idea. And you say Ions published your book. It's only the third book that they have published Does yeah they hurt? they published um i think the handbook on near death experiences that's uh, and then they had this uh the other book that's a really wonderful book that's uh the self does not die uh if if you allow me to say something about that book then it's it's really interesting and my book actually is uh, the third one because it's that's the uh, impressions of near death experiences it ha it contains um hundreds of quotes of near-death experiencers um, ordered in, in 12 um, chapters uh, that start with, of course, getting out of your body. And then the last one being the, how do you get into your body and after effects, but also things about the light and um, that everyone is important, uh, veridical observations, uh, distressing NDEs, uh, life reviews, etc. But this other book, um, the self does not die. That's a really important book because it is um, it's a bit of a, um, a scientific work, 
in which uh, theoretical observations are being uh, explained. And uh, there are hundreds of uh, uh, examples of theoretical observations. And theoretical observations are specific near-death experiences where uh, the end the ear um, gets out of his, his or her body and roams around in the hospital, for instance, or around the place where they, uh, they had the accident. Um, and they they see some things or specific uh, things happen and they can see that. And once they go back to their body again uh, after their NDE, they say, well, I've seen this and that. Uh, and that can be uh, uh, confirmed uh, by someone else. And the idea is that um, these NDEs couldn't have seen these things while being in the body because uh, the thing was outside the hotel, uh, the hospital room or uh, somewhere else. And they nevertheless saw it and it was confirmed that it was there. Uh, so that gives you um, circumstantial evidence that your consciousness can exist outside your body uh, and be independent. And, and then the idea is uh, that you can also think that the rest of what the end ears say about the light and, and things like that, the other, the heavenly environment, that that is also um, could be true. But, that, you know, it's not that there's proof about the uh, heavenly environment. It's only proof that the consciousness can exist outside our body. And maybe I can give you an example because for your viewers, it will be like a, a very uh, theoretical uh, talk when I say this. But there is a very nice example of uh, a, a woman who, who was caught in a uh, traffic accident in the United States. She eventually wound up with her car under a truck in front of her. So it was really damaged. She was had to get out uh, of the truck, uh, out of her car. Uh, and then she was unconscious. She was taken uh, by helicopter to a hospital. And during the flight, she had her NDE. And during the NDE, she, um, she saw her life. Uh, and But she also saw the future or a possible future. So she, she saw that she could have grandchildren. Now, and when she saw that, she, she pleaded with God uh, not to let her die because she wanted to have the experience with grandchildren. Uh, she didn't have any children herself because she was, I think, 18 at the time. Uh, and Eight, um, and her, 18. She, yeah, 18 she was at the time or something very young. Uh, I think it was 18. And she, she didn't have children of her own, but she saw the grandchildren and she wanted to have the grandchildren. And then, and then she, uh, she pleaded with God. And, and uh, the moment that uh, she asked uh, God to, to let her live, uh, she was out um, in the, uh, she, was, she found herself in the hospital room against the ceiling looking onto her bed where she was laying. Uh, and, um, and then she, uh, she also um, could uh, roam around the hospital while her, bed, uh, her body was still in bed and she could still go anywhere else. And she went to the cafeteria because her parents were there. She was drawn to the cafeteria, she were, the parents were there. And um, the father was very nervous, of course, because the daughter was in a bad shape. Uh, and then, uh, he said he wanted to have a smoke. And then uh, one of the grandmothers was there as well. Both were there, but one of them said, uh, oh, I need to have a smoke as well. I need to go with you. And the other grandma said the same thing. So the two grandmas went with the father to have a smoke, whereas they never smoked and they would have never smoked in the future. So, and that was so odd. Uh, and once um, she came out of her um, her situations, she recovered. She spoke about uh, this uh, to her parents, uh, and she said, "I I could see everything that was happening in the in the hospital, and I even saw you in the cafeteria, and I I saw you talk about uh, getting a smoke, and and grandmas had the smoke as well. And when she said that." Her mother was like, "That's impossible." It's, it, that's that. When she said that, she thought, 
this is true. She really was there. Uh, and there are hundreds of those stories where people uh, say things, have seen things outside where they, they where their body was, uh, and that was corroborated or confirmed later on. And that's very important to, to give some that's what evidence. They mean when they say vertical observation. And that's vertical. Now that's, I don't like that term because it's a kind of, I don't know, scientific term, but that's how it's called in the United States, vertical observations. Yeah, and it's not a common word, you know. That we no, it's not common. Them. No, no. No, that's, you can say, uh, in, in Dutch, we don't have such a word. So, and in German, neither. So we call it um, verifiable out-of-body experience. Experience, which is more accurate, I think. Yeah, I know they put a lot of stock in that, and but even with that, they can say, "Well, we verified it with her family," but but the audience don't know, you know the readers don't know. No, that's, that's true. You yeah. know what I mean? Like like my drowning at five years old, I saw everything that was going on below, and twenty years later, I talked to my family about it. Yeah, that happened. Yeah, that happened. Yeah, well, that's what we were doing. But nobody has went knocked on my family's door and said, is this true? Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. and um, I don't have a relationship with my family where I would invite them into my home to, you know, even discuss it. But, but, you know, that would yeah. be called that vertical evidence, but yet, you know, nobody's going to go knock on the door, nor are they most of these in the ears. Are they going to actually go and talk to witnesses? And if they do talk to witnesses, how do we know the witness are line and then i feel like there's so many roadblocks yeah. into really investigate i used to be an investigator for children's services so i had this investigator mentality you know how do we get these witnesses how do we verify this information and um without getting anybody in a court of law or, or a polygraph machine it's really hard hmm. yeah that, but i can give you another example that is uh, maybe more uh, there's more proof there. And in another instance, uh, someone was brought into a hospital with uh, uh, problems around the heart. They it needed to have more, um, uh, how do you say that? Uh, you know, you put arteries around the heart. And there's a special term uh, for this. That had to be done. So the, uh, the, the, um, the surgeon came in and uh, said something that what they were going to do. And then um, he was sedated. So he, he was uh, out of, um, his consciousness was not there anymore. Uh, that's a medical term. Uh, sedation, that's, yeah. Um, yeah. It's very common. So, yeah, anesthesia, total anesthesia. So okay. he couldn't see and hear what was happening, yet he saw everything what was happening. And the, the funny thing was that he saw the the, uh, the surgeon moving his, uh, putting his hands on his chest and pointing his elbows out and then uh, pointing uh, at stuff for the, the, the nurses. Uh, um, and that was so odd because he had never seen anyone do such a thing. Uh, and uh, when he came by, uh, to, he, he said, he, he spoke about this, and the nurses immediately contacted uh, Bruce Grayson, who is a, an, an investigator, a researcher of um, uh, near-death experiences, and he documented this. He had the discussion with the, the surgeon and with the and the ear, and um, uh, so that's more objective, I would say. Yeah, I've so heard Bruce, he, Bruce talk he, about that case. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, so that's, and there are more of those cases where it has been uh, confirmed uh, more independent maybe than my previous example, uh, although that one has been uh, confirmed also uh, by having meetings with the with the family and with the... Yeah, the yeah I think uh, most people are past the point of the skeptic. I think most people that follow near-death experiences are you know, past the point, they need evidence or verification, anything like that. And I think most sadly just want to be entertained. Like they don't even care if the story oh, yeah. is true. Mm -hmm. They just want to hear this interesting story, like a bedtime story. They just want yeah, to, yeah. a lot of them actually fall asleep to them. Like they help them fall asleep, listen to this story, you know, like, like children too at night, you know, they hear stories. And um, I, the first example you had, I noticed that you had said that the lady pleaded with God. Do you yes. find that a lot in your research that there's some 
asking of God or this voice saying, it's not your time, go back. And that there's yes. some kind of higher intelligence controlling all of this. Yes. Well, the, the, the way to go back again, uh, most, well, many end the years don't want to go back. Uh, I don't know if it's most, but many don't want to go back. But then there is a discussion going on, uh, something like uh, along the lines of, uh, you have been uh, on earth, it was your own choice, you had to do stuff, uh, you wanted to do experiencing certain things, and you're not finished yet. And then they, it's shown to them what they, uh, what they agree to, and then they decide to go back again. Or sometimes they are uh, gently, it's always gently uh, told they really have to go back. But there are also people who really want to go back by themselves. They, they say, like in this case, she wanted to experience having these grandchildren. And there's an other, there are other cases. One, one case is of a woman who had a child uh, and wanted to go back to the child to look after her. And she knew that once she had to go back again to her child, uh, as she had to go back to earth, she would lose all the knowledge that she acquired there on the other side. So she, because she saw so many things, she understood more about everything, about the whole life, about earth, why we are on earth, etc. And she, she knew she couldn't take that with her. And then she thought of one sentence that she wanted to remember in order to, uh, that would say it all. And that one sentence, she kept on to it uh, uh, once she went down uh, to her body. And then uh, that sentence was, um, all is everything and everything is one. So all is everything and everything is one. And that's I one noticed the that's a big term in, near, in, in IONS, is this, we are all one. I feel like yes. they really push that. Um, yeah. I'm not hearing yeah. it from in the ears, but I'm really hearing it from ions that they just push it. Oh, in the ears say we are all one. I'm like, I haven't heard a single person say that. Maybe a few. In my book, but I think they heard it somewhere chapter. else. <laughs> in my book, there's a whole chapter with many quotes of people who have said that. So we are, there, a lot of people say at least that we are very closely uh, connected uh, to each other. Uh, but there are also people that say we are one uh, and there are even people that say we are a part of God or that we are God. Uh, um, so there's uh, this unity that is being uh, recognized by a lot of Andy ears. There are really a lot of uh, quotes from Andy ears that say that. Maybe you haven't seen it. I understand you have had your NDE too. And that's one of the things that uh, strikes me it's not one NDE is equal to another they are all different I've had two NDEs and they're very different by years apart yeah so that's that's uh, that shows what I mean it's different and that's what I try to say also in my book if you like if you go to Amsterdam uh, you have never been there but there is right. Amsterdam we have a dam uh, that's why it's called Amsterdam and on the dam where there's a palace uh, and if you are on the dam you see the palace you see the front side of the palace but you don't see the back side or the sides or even the inside the inside is very beautiful so you need more points of view to see something and that's what I try to do with my book uh, have so many quotes um, uh, show, so it gives you an impression of what an NDE is hence the name or the title of my book, Impressions of Near-Death Experiences. That's what I try to do. It's not that I say, pe tell people what they should believe. It's just, I put all these quotes of uh, all these end years, well, a, a lot of end years to them uh, so they can find their own conclusion. Hmm. I interviewed but, but Raymond me, Moody recently. Sorry? I interviewed Raymond Moody recently. And uh, I forget who it was. Somebody sent me a little short. They took a clip out of it, of me and him talking. It was something he said about that. He said, oh, some people have these, you know, there's seven steps to NDE or there's this, you know, they try to fit it all in this box. And he says, if NDEs have taught us anything, I wish I could quote him correctly. Like they even made a short and I was just listening to it. Um, something like it, it, what NDE should teach us is that there's no way that we'll ever understand it completely. It's way beyond all of our comprehensions. 
Yes, I, I, I believe that's true because it's uh, the other side is, I refer to it as the other side, the heavenly environment that people see or even also the distressing parts of it. The other side is so different from what we have here. Uh, for instance, time doesn't work like it does here. There's a linear time here. We can't go back to the uh, to history, or we can't go ahead in the future. But there, it seems to be that it's not in time. Uh, the experience is not in time. That's one of the quotes of the end years. Or another one that I really like is, uh, all time is there at the same time. So whatever you did in your life, uh, also your birth is still there. It, it is accessible uh, to see what happened around you. So um, the, the other area or the other realm is totally different. It's, it's, we, we can never understand fully what it is with our three-dimensional brains and time. We, we, uh, so we uh, have four dimensions. So we can't understand what it is, and I agree with you. It's it's, and that's what I, apparently uh, Moody said as well. We can, we can never wrap our uh, heads around it, but we can have all these quotes and get some kind of impression of what an NDE is, and then hopefully, um, uh, if it's true that everyone will find this uh, unconditional love, then uh, then we then we can be uh, happy. <laughs> I didn't Something. think about doing this till just now, but if you don't mind, I give you, give me a minute. I would like to read something I wrote the other day. It kind okay. of sums up what I feel. Um, our body. Uh, okay. Our body. I wrote it on. This is a Facebook post from two days ago. Our body is our spacesuit. It holds us down to earth so we can explore life here in a physical world with freedom. When our spacesuit malfunctions, we are ejected and return to our mothership. We travel through a core that sucks us up through space, or we are escorted by guardians. We may roam around Earth a while out of body if the guardians know we are going back. They don't always know. Sometimes the decision hasn't been made yet. Sometimes your mission is complete, and sometimes it's not. If it's not, you are sent back to finish your life on Earth. Sometimes you are told it's not your time. You must go back. You have a job to do. Rarely are you sent back if it is your time, but it does happen in dire situations when you insist you are needed on earth for some purpose. Our mothership is located in another dimension of time and space. Guardians are there that are recording all of our memories. They know everything about us. It is the land of all knowledge. There is a compassionate, highly intelligent being in charge. All guardians wait for his command and swiftly carry out his orders. Sorry about that. His son is by his side at all times, who has a body form as we do there, only they are transparent and not solid flesh as on earth. Our language isn't done by tongue there. It is transmitted by telepathic thought. The one in charge controls every major decision, but otherwise we are free to express ourselves how we wish. Yet anything dirty, horrible, or disturbing is quickly washed clean and disappears. It is removed from you and from this perfect place. There are beautiful cities, buildings, streets, forests, oceans, beaches, rivers, and creeks, and fields of green grass and flowers. It is like earth, only more beautiful and never dirty, and everything is alive. Everything communicates. There are no language barriers or restrictions by nature. There are things they don't do there. There are rules and the guardians obey and carry out orders. You are listened to with compassion by the wisest authority, ancient, now, and futuristic. That was my little <laughs> take on all this. Is there anything that you catches you or you disagree with or agree with? <laughs> It's, it's, it's very nice that you say all these things that it's very interesting how you put these things there. It's, it's true. It's, I mean, we are, um, this is our vessel. And some people say it's our meat puppet, uh, what contains the real thing. So we are just squeezed in it. Uh, one person even said when she had to go back to her body, with her, her expense was so big um, and she she thought 
how can they ever get me into this uh, thing? And she said, it's, it's like putting an elephant into a Coca-Cola can. It's really, it's impossible. So it's really a vessel that we temporarily uh, uh, live in. And many end years say the other realm, uh, that's our home. That's our real home. That's where we belong. That's where we will go back to. We came from there. We will go back to that uh, place. And um, I, I think you said something like uh, there is a freedom here on Earth. Um, we have, um, that's a thing that I understand. We, we do have uh, free choice. Uh, but the real freedom is on the other side because here we are confined to our body to the three dimensions plus time. I have to. I had to be here at this uh, meeting with you at five o'clock, <laughs> so there's time for me. And you are on the other side of the or, or a quarter of the globe. Uh, I'm. I'm here. We can't just go hop over, and I can't be with you for just this uh, half an hour or an hour. Uh, so th we are confined here, um, and that's that makes it difficult. We need to have some food. Uh, on the other side, you don't have to struggle for food. It's, there's no time. We can do anything uh, at the same time. So that, that makes it different. Um, but we, we do have uh, a, a free will, um, although sometimes um, end years also see things in the future. And those things really happen. And that brings you to a, a, a thought, uh, how can there be free choice if it's already determined that you are going to do this or that. And uh, a friend of mine who had an NDE said, well, it's because the whole thing there with time is different than here. Like if we are on a crossroads here uh, and we think, shall we go left or shall we go right? Um, we are still struggling with that choice here, but there, they can access time in a different way. They see which road we have taken later on. So they know already that we are going to the left side, uh, for instance, uh, and then they they know that it, that's the case. We go left, um, but we don't know it when we are in the struggle. And then later on, we will see that it's uh, that we really went left. And she said, it's like, uh, if you are in, and she is from uh, the Netherlands, so she had Amsterdam in her in mind, and Harlem is a, a town 11 miles from uh, Amsterdam. So she said, if I'm in Harlem, I can't see Amsterdam. If I'm in Amsterdam, I can't see Harlem. But if I'm in, a, in an airplane, I can see them both at the same time. You just need to have a different uh, vantage point. And that's what they have on the other side. They have a different vantage point. So that's that's a little bit of uh, something to do with time. I thought that was a very nice uh, uh, comparison. Like uh, the first example you gave of the woman at near death experiencer, she wanted to have children. She wanted to have grandchildren, yes. and it was yes. like a choice then. Like it maybe it was her time, and yeah. and it's it's just amazing even that thought that we all have a time. Because when my second NDE, I was told the answer was no. It was my time. I'd never heard of it. Not your time. It was not, it said, I was told the answer was no. They said, it is yeah. your time. The oh. answer was no, I couldn't go back. I want to go back and raise my little boys. I had three baby boys at home. And um, and I, I was screaming, throwing a fit. I wanted to go back. And I was told the answer was no, it no. is your time. And I pled my case. I to go back anyway. Yes. Yeah. And wow. I was shown, because uh, Jesus took me um down to earth i said because i said to god i said if you can show me that my boys will be better off without me for whatever reason i agree to stay but if not i beg to return and then i seen a man from behind with brown wavy hair just from behind mm -hmm. no face you know just from behind and it's like i just joined him and we was down in earth above our trailer and then all of a sudden the roof of the trailer was gone and we were dipped down and i saw my boys I believe it was the next day. I always said it was in the future, but it could have been that far in the future as they look the same age. And I got thinking about it recently. I was like, you know, I think it was the same day because it was like they had just been told that I was dead. That I hadn't really sunk in because my um, son, Jeremy, said to his older brother, Matthew, he says, I don't care that you say mom is dead. I want her back. and I want her back right now. And he was so upset that I retracted. And I'm back in heaven. And I and I was sobbing. 
and then my I I was invisible. Then I see my hands because now I have physical body, and um, I see my hands come up from my face, and I was crumbled at Jesus' feet, who's sitting beside God. It's all like his bright white. It's like when something's too dark, you can't see, but it's too light. I couldn't see well. Mm-hmm. And I said, and my hands went from my face and I looked up and I said, who else will teach them about you? And then I'm back in the wheelchair. So, mm-hmm. you know, all these decades later, because I was 25 at the time, I think, how did I see a day in the future that never happened? Like I saw a day in the future that was going to happen if, mm-hmm. if I wasn't returned. And so that has just left me. And I, maybe that was the reason why I'm left with this gratitude that that day never happened. My boys didn't have to suffer like that. They didn't have to grow up without a mother. Cause that was my fear them growing mm-hmm. up without my protection and my love to grow up without a mother's love, you know, and that maybe they'd be angry men and hate God. And then they would never go to heaven. And so mm-hmm. that's why I asked who else will teach them about you? Because, you know, I was, you know, raised my grandma would make sure my, my parents were might as well say atheists, but my grandma made sure us guy as kids went to church and and I and I felt that they would not go to heaven if they rejected Jesus, they rejected rejected God. You know, that, that was my thought at 25. Hmm? But I think everyone goes to heaven. Also people that are, don't adhere to Christianity, Muslims or Buddhists also go to heaven. So I don't know. Yeah, and, and that's and that's your that. thought. But then then it's a then to say near all near death experiences feel that way. You know, that's is what I think Moody was trying to shy shy us away from is not to make these and I try, I have to struggle too, you know. And that's why I worded that Facebook post the way I did without my religion into it. But as to look at it without that, and just that this is another, you know, place and, and there's guardians and and those things because I experienced those things in my two Indies. And, and, and in the there years is a lot I've of interviewed and heard. Uh-huh. There's a, I mean, there not one ND is the same as another. But one of the things that you also said is that we all have a task. Uh, and that, that's also what I understand from ND years. You wouldn't be here if you don't have a task. So, and that makes everyone important. Everyone on earth is important. For uh, if you were not uh, having a task or not important, you would not be here because then your time is, is over. Uh, so it, it and it doesn't have to be very big. You don't have to be a king or a queen or a president or whatever. It can be just being nice or having to do with a neighbor or with a, a company. You have to uh, set up a company or you have children or you have your teacher or you name it. It can be something like that. It, it, it's everyone yeah. is important. Yeah. What I think the only place where we differ, I place we differ, I think is where when you say there's no good or bad, it's like my all my walls go up, you mm-hmm. know, because there is good neighbor, bad neighbor, uh, a criminal versus a victim. You know, we we do live in these things, and we as parents do unconditionally love our children no matter what crimes they commit. And so I and God I, does it as well, and God does as well. Um, yes. and that and and as God's children we try to be good and in, in my view we try to be, and i've always lived my life i mean i was when i was a teenager there's about a year i just tried to be bad you know it didn't work out well but other than that you know i've always tried to be good and i raised a lot of children foster kids and you know try to teach them to be good and then you can see how their lives turn out bad when they are bad they lost custody of their children because of the drugs and because of their criminal activity and, and their boyfriends went to prison for murder. You know, it's just like there, it, there really is, there's good and bad. And, and we want our children to obey the law they, and not go to prison. And Nevertheless, they are loved unconditionally by uh, God or Allah or the Supreme one, as I like to call it. The, the love there on the other side is so big, you cannot wrap your head around it. Right. So, it just doesn't mean there's not consequences. People in their life reviews um, that feel the pain. Like when my son cried to his brother, I don't care that you say mom is dead, I want her back. I felt his pain. I will never forget. And I thought, you know what? People talk about going to hell. That was my personal hell. Yeah, that to hurts. feel yeah. my son's pain. Because I had a two pregnancy, that's why I died. And I had my ex was a Catholic, and I wanted a lot of kids. He come from 
uh, 12 kids. And I thought I would get to have my big family at about 20 years older, my second C-section, before my second season. He said I had to get my tubes tied. Five years later, I found I could get reversed. That caused my two pregnancy. That caused my twins to die, caused me to die. And I'm, that's why I'm staying in heaven at, and begging to go back at 25 years old. And so where was I going with that? About uh, the, 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 the thing that I would like to react on this is that uh, if, if you have your life review and you see what you did to others, if you want to see it as a punishment that you feel what it is as being that other, you know, you can see that as a, as a, as a punishment. So you, that makes that every action here is a zero sum game. If I do something to you, I will feel it as I, as if I am you. Uh, but nevertheless, there's also uh, stories about people that say even uh, when I was uh, so um, regretful and angry about what I did to others, the light still loved me unconditionally. Even yeah, I, yeah, I wasn't judged by them. I was judged by me. Yeah, that's that's the whole thing. The, the but, one there is no judge there. The only one, if there is a judge, it is you. But yeah, even I judge then, myself extremely harshly yeah. in the bright white light. Yeah, but I, I have another story where a person did the same thing as you, and then the light said, "You don't have to be so hard on yourself. You are loved anyway." Yeah, I, I mean. The boat okay my drowning NDE if I had a bad thought like I look down and I see my brother on my board because he took it middle of the pond to cause me to drown so I was angry he caused me to drown and he don't care he's off doing it. and I felt that mm -hmm. anger and it was an anger at five years old that I had never experienced this was I say like an anger a grown man would have it was mm -hmm. huge never experienced that as a child but I felt this huge like a thunder roaring anger and then it was like swept away from me. And then later mm -hmm. I looked down, I saw my sister talking to my mom on the bed sheet. Like, they don't even realize I died. They're not even looking for me. And I saw my older sister talking to my mom and I felt jealousy. I thought I'll never be old enough because I'm dead to be able to talk to mom like that, you know, mature female way. I'll never get to be older and talk to have these adult conversations with my mother. And I felt this jealousy. And then it was washed away. And then I noticed my second NDE, like when I felt my son's pain. And then when I was back in bright white light, then it was washed away. And then I had another feeling, oh my gosh, once I'm in the bright white light, sobbing and crying, then I back in the white light. Then I think, oh my gosh, what if my sons are so angry that they never come to heaven? Because at first I thought, okay, you know, I I'll see them someday when they come. I'm like, oh, well, if they're so angry, they never come. And then I'm back bowling again. And then when I say, who else will teach them about you? And then I'm back in the wheelchair. And so at least such an impression about the other side mm -hmm. that God just gave your life back. Just like the woman in the helicopter you were talking about, she pleaded yes. with God, you know, there's so many times and uh, there's one in the ear I have on um, Carlos. He was in the ocean. He was drowning and he's like, okay, I give up. And he heard God's voice say, like for him, was it to, to ask? He's like, ask, there's no way I'm under the ball of the ocean. The riptide kept pulling me back. I'm exhausted. You know, I can't get back again. What are you talking about? And then he's like, ask. And so he's like, okay. And he asked and he prayed all of a sudden a dolphin, it was on video. Like somebody on this boat actually caught on video. The dolphin come along, picked him up and he was right on top of the dolphin and a boat, the boat come along and picked him up. And he's mm -hmm. like, you take me to the nearest church. And the guy's just a sweetheart. And I was like, and that stuck with me. I was like, you know, ask just like that woman did. She asked just like I did. I asked, you know, and that's, I think that's that a, is important during the NDE. If you want to go back. Is, yeah. There's a lot of people that ask uh, a lot of stuff there. There's a, a, a nice story about uh, Christina. Uh, it's a little girl of eight. She was assaulted. She was uh, attacked by two men and they wanted to drown her. And she was with her head under the water, looking up at the sun. And she could see both the picture of the sun. And she was also hovering above herself, looking down on these two uh, men, doing, uh, trying to um, 
drown her. And she saw her father coming uh, to rescue her. And then they left her alone and she recovered, but she had her NDE. And in her NDE, she had, uh, she said, she was an eight year old girl. Uh, she said, I had a, a, a conversation with God. It, it, it could not be anyone else than God because that was what I feel. And he said, you have to live um, and you will, um, uh, it's very easy there. I can give you a recipe for life of what to do in life. And it consists of four ingredients. It's, it's very easy. And the, the, the ingredients are uh, love, uh, be love, just be and experience life. And that's what she she says all the time. So, and the, the interesting thing is, the last two things, like uh, just be and experience life, you don't have to do anything for it because that's easy. You just you can sit on a chair and you you are, and you, you can experience life, but that's kind of dull. <laughs> it's nicer I to think go that, around and do that. Nice just thing. be is gonna like let things go. Yeah, like you're and trying then, to control yeah, things. Just be, it be, it's nice to be here. It's uh, it, try to enjoy it as well. And she said, uh, the uh, the two uh, other things, the two first things, love and be loved, that requires action, and that shows you that love is important. Also here on Earth, it's not only important on the other side, or it's 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 everywhere on the other side but it's also important here. And that was maybe also a bit of an answer to your, your question. Can you just be bad and still have uh, unconditional love? And the answer is yes, but it's nicer to be to try to be giving love to others or being loved because some people find it very difficult to be loved. It's, it's easier to give something to someone else, but it's, if you give something to someone else, there needs to be someone accepting it. So that applies also to yourself. So don't only give love to others, but also accept it from others. And that requires action. That makes life so interesting. I think that's why a lot of it's a little off topic, but why, why so many women go from one abusive relationship with the man to another is maybe they weren't loved as a child they didn't experience love so you know a nice guy that loves them it's not going to feel right it's going to feel foreign it's going to feel weird they're used to abuse they're used to always trying to get that love and never getting it and uh people can be like almost addicted to abuse and not realize it because they they don't just like to be loved they don't um, respect themselves enough to say wait a minute i'm going to be loved i'm going to be treated like this during my mm -hmm. first indie the five-year-old drowning i was shown like a knowing that my family didn't love me and I was the youngest of five kids. And a lot of people have said, Oh, there's no way that you were shown that God wouldn't show you something bad. And I said, but it was true. And, but at five years old, I, did, I was showed I wasn't loved by my family. And I like, well, I knew my siblings thought I was a little brat. And, uh, and my oldest sister, she's disabled. She really don't know what's going on. And my dad, I really knew he didn't like me, but my mom thought she loved me. And then a clear voice said, God sends children here to be loved. That is why he sends them here. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, a five-year-old, you know, like my hands on my hip, like, wait a minute, you just showed me my family don't love me. And then you tell me that, that children are still here to be loved. That's why God sends them here, but I'm not loved. And so this feeling of injustice grew that has never left me. This little mm -hmm. smart ass, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. just mad injustice everywhere you go. That's not right. That's bad. That's not right. You know, it's just got me through my entire life. <laughs> but that's, that's you touched upon something important. If you if you have experienced no love during your first years, that you carry that with you. But it's also if you look at uh, places less fortunate than where we live. I mean, we live in affluent societies. But you can be born in a place where there is uh, no affluency, there is, where there's nothing, and you have to struggle. And uh, where you see uh, examples where men hit their, their women uh, or shoot people. Um, so you start out with um, a, a disadvantage, I would say. Uh, that's why I 
find it so important to say that everyone is loved. Also, those people that are in such a situation and uh, being in a dis disadvantageous position that they haven't shown, haven't been shown what it is to love someone else. Um, also for them, there is unconditional love uh, later on. And also to the perpetrators, uh, they always have a story where they come from uh, and why they do things that they do. Yeah, that's that's what I understand. And that's what I value so much in NDEs. That it's, it's, it's not like we can do whatever we want to do. We, I can go around in the street and kick everyone's uh, something. Uh, that's That's not going to be nice for me when I'm in my NDE and looking back onto my life. But if I do these things because I was taught to do them or to shoot people because it's that's normal in my area, yeah, it's it's you know you can't um, we it's not up to us to judge uh, others. It, it's we have to think uh, the light loves everyone. Uh, no matter what. So that's why I always say, take into your uh, consciousness or think about someone who you really despise, could be a politician or someone around the, the corner, but also those people are being loved unconditionally, eventually. And, you know, as a Catholic, as, as my ex-husband was Catholic, he said you was raised Catholic, and, you know, you're taught that uh, suicide is the one unforgivable sin. And then hearing these NDEs and and giving things thought and having some kind and uh, I'm I've known uh, a coworker that committed suicide and had a uh, I guess uh, felt him after the day after, um, and it just seems like I think I don't know like Dr. Moody says we don't know all we have, you know is but I think maybe that the suicides or anybody that's had harmed anyone and, and, and like me feeling my son's pain that I had died, the, what we cause, you know, in that life review, I think can be because of personal experience can be so excruciating. I can only imagine that someone committed suicide is going to see and feel what their parents felt, what their children felt, what their friends felt, the person, the responders that found them, everybody that was affected. I think, we're going to have that because I believe I, I call the other side, like the land of all knowing we're going to have all the access to all the knowledge, you know, say yes. we are one, you know, we're going to know what they f are feeling on earth. That but nevertheless, struggling also, with. people who committed suicide, there are a lot of stories of and uh, people who did that and had a very nice uh, blissful NDE with uh, uh, the light and unconditional love as well so it's not that well that's taught by the the catholic church uh, uh suicide is unforgivable i think nothing is unforgivable to god god is too. much bigger than right. anyone in our thinking any one of the religions god is so much bigger it's, it's and, it's and our nde huge. is just you know one toe over there you know it's not the full experience like none of us know what is going to go on with them? Like they're, they're shown this blissful thing. And I think I've always say that we are shown in our near death experiences, because God knows we're going back. God knows everything. He, he knows the future. He knows we're going back. So I think he gives us the experience that we need to continue our life in a better way. You know, the experience yeah. I had made my life better because I live with gratitude. I was able to raise my children. And where someone that has a suicidal NDE, because I have interviewed people and I have heard other stories of them, and it seems like they are given the love, the reassurance, the acceptance they never had that led them to the yeah. suicidal point that now they can go out and then change their lives. You know, I had this one guy, he was trans, he was a college professor and he was trans and living as Scarlet, this woman. And he was alcoholic. He was using drugs. He was like a prostitute. He was just this horrible mess. He was angry. He was in this rage and he had this suicidal moment. He had, he was recovering from one suicide attempt and he's having this moment. And all of a sudden he started talking to Jesus and he had a spiritual experience that's close to an NDE and it changed his life 
to where not just all in one day, but gradually he threw away the wigs. He threw away the clothes. Mm -hmm. He, he started dressing as a man. He started ministering in the streets. A few years later, he went back to being scarlet and he totally just gave up. And, but, but I always felt that he was given the love, the, to give him the self-esteem that he needed. And, you know, yeah. and, and everybody seems to be given. Everyone is accepted by God, no mm -hmm. matter how they dress or how they act. Everyone is accepted. That's what I understand from so yeah. many end years. And, yeah. and I, about I, suicide, people that do commit suicide or attempt because if they if it works out, then we can't talk to them. If If they fail, we can talk to them. And, you know, people don't do suicide just for fun it's always there's something before that there's uh, they have had such a bad experience in one or other way it's not like you you take a candy or so it's suicide is really something it's not something <laughs> it's not something you do overnight mm -hmm. it's there's a lot of things going before that but what I understand is even people that have committed suicide uh, will wind up eventually in the in the wonderful area. They they have had blissful NDEs. It's very nice. I think it's important to say that. It, nevertheless, I would advocate against suicide. Uh, and as a funny thing or interesting thing is that NDEers do that as well, especially also NDEers who try to commit. Uh, suicide and failed and had an NDE, they would typically say there is a reason for us being on earth while we are here. And then I uh, realized again, or I want to remember uh, what Christina heard, love, be loved, just be and uh, experience life. How bad life is. I mean, it's, it is something you, life is given to you and it's if you look back on it from this other point of view, when you're ha when you're in your NDE or when you're really dead, you'll understand why you are here and why you have had those uh, bad periods or, or difficult things to go through. Uh, you will we will understand everything. We won't understand it now, perhaps, but then we will understand everything. My understanding is so easy to have so much uh, consideration or uh, a forgiveness uh, for people who did uh, bad things. Bad, uh, what I try to say is, yeah, it's a word from the earth. Yeah, from what I've understand, from my own experience and from people that have either been guests or otherwise, a suicide, it seems, you know, they call suicide call it suicidal ideation for a reason. It's like this voice is grooming you to do it, making it okay. It's a liar. This voice gets in your head and it lies to you and it grooms you. It makes you think that this is a wonderful thing to do. And then it's almost like this, like a devil, like an evil, like you want to put those names on it. And if uh, someone that uh, attempted suicide and they're lucky enough to come back or didn't follow through or whatever, if they look at it through their family and friends side, if they, cause this is a selfish act and it may not feel that way. It could be a selfish act. It could be an act of revenge on other people, but if they see it from, you know, how this hurt their family, their friends, um, then they would, I would think be more pr prone to promise not to do that again because of the people it hurt that they even attempted. Yeah, even there's also through. people that are in such a very, very bad situation, really without any uh, view to changing it, uh, that they, uh, or they, that's what they perceive. And then they think it's better to, to be mm -hmm. away. They don't always hear this, what, what you call an evil voice or so, but it's, it can, you can be in such a, a terrible situation that you don't see any uh, way out other than just commit suicide. Yeah, and that's and, that that's that grooming though. There's a grooming voice in there that oh, there's no other way out. This is okay. There's a something there, something, some kind of energy that pushes people. That's what I believe. But like like Raymond Moody said, I don't believe in evilness. We we don't know. There's so much we'll never know. Like we can't say it's it true. is like this. Nope, it's like that. We can't. All we can do is say this is beyond all of us. 
and we can scratch the surface and we can peek in and but that's I think that's the most frustrating thing about doing end e research learning about this stuff is like we're never gonna have the mind of God to know it no, all we will well I think we are a uh, part of God. So we we have all the knowledge within us, all the, the we just need to express our divinity. And that's uh, our purpose. And the divinity is love. Uh, that's the most important thing. So, but you're, you're right if you say we will never really understand the whole thing. And that's why I, in my book, try to give more points of view. If, if that's what I try to say with the palace, you don't see the, the whole palace, if you just look at it from the front side, you need to have so many points of view to get some impression of what the palace is about. And the palace is then the the the, the real thing when we die uh, at the afterlife or whatever. So, and 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 ease, as you said before, it's just putting your little toe on the other side, and and we think we know it all. We don't know it all. It's it's. Mm-hmm. But if you have millions of toes on the other side you get some kind of impression of what the whole thing is and and the nice thing i think is that we are uh, that love is so important and that we are unconditionally loved and also um, that we are actually part of one big whole uh, that's that's what i understand there's a lot of quotes in that direction and I, for me, as to try to understand all of this and so many conflicting ideas is to just kind of acknowledge our own biases, you know, because there, there are agendas in this. There are agendas that's trying to turn people away from church. There are agendas that are just solely Christian NDEs and turning people away from other NDEs and organizations because they're not Christian. And so there becomes this left and right now <laughs> that they're there, competing also forces. Have, also Muslims have uh, NDEs and have wonderful NDEs and see God uh, or Allah, as they say, and also Buddhists, any religion. There's also atheists who do not believe in Jesus. They have NDEs and they don't go uh, go running to a church or to a mosque or to a temple to to be involved in a specific religion. Uh, so it, it that's why I say the real thing, a God or how you want to call it, the supreme one, is so much bigger than any one religion. It's it covers everything. It, it we cannot wrap our heads around how big, how powerful, how forgiving how loving this this uh, uh supreme one is or a god uh, and it's in the bible it's in the bible it says god is all love uh and there's many of those quotes there and yeah. we have to acknowledge too there are fakes and you know, liars there are people lying about ndes um and there's people that encourage people to lie about ndes i know an indie ear he said Peggy, so-and-so told me that if I say that God told me that it's okay to be homosexual, my NDE, they will get me on this certain show. And I was like, hold up. This person you're talking about, they they have no connection to that show, first of all. So they're lying but to you right you, there. Do you say that being homosexual is bad? They they No, they're saying if you say in your that your NDE told you that something that it was okay to be homosexual. That's what they want them to say. They want them to lie about what they experienced in their NDE. If you say that, we will get you on this show. Right? Promise him fame and fortune. If he will lie about what he saw. He didn't see that. If somebody's seen that, fine. But you know yeah, but there, there are there are NDEs, uh gay NDEs who have had their NDE and have had a, a blissful time. I understand they, that. And where where uh, God, it, it was one of them even asked, um, it didn't, it, it, he saw his life review and he, he uh, that went past and then he realized that it didn't touch upon his being gay. Uh, and then he, he had a second life review that was interesting. Uh, and then he finally asked, uh, I have this issue 
uh, I'm gay, would I still be acceptable to God? And then there was a big laughter on the other side and it said, of course you are accepted, no matter what, even if being gay. But what I'm saying is, I'm not disputing that. I'm saying that this person was approached by someone that asked them to lie about their NDE to hmm. say these things that okay, never yeah. happened during the NDE. And then yeah. I know another NDE or a friend of mine, they were approached um, and said, we're doing a survey. And if you say that you have visions of the future that imply this and this that would meet their political agenda, then we hmm. will use it during our talk at this organization, which will help your book sales. So suddenly everybody is saying, oh yeah, my I had visions and they said this. And you know, people are being conned, persuaded mm -hmm. because people are using near-death experiences to further their agenda, whether mm -hmm. they want people going towards church, towards Christianity, or if they want them going away from Christianity, away from church, or their whatever it is their agenda is they're they are using near-death experiences yeah I, I hear what you say and then so I think that's it, was just my point it's it's i think it's not very wise uh, to be lying or not real faithful about your nde and if if i look back uh, if i look at all the end years that i spoke uh i cannot uh think that they would do such a thing. But of course, people are people and people can be lured into saying things that are not true. That's true. Yeah, that can be happening. I don't yeah, know. I mean, there's I, ones I, I believe for years. Be surprised, yeah. But if you say that happened, then yeah, maybe that's okay. Oh, it's definitely out there. It's definitely out there. In fact, um, I had somebody a while back say, um, I never told anybody this before, but I'm ready to talk about it. I had an NDE. Okay, that's good. But Somebody told her that if she come on and said she had an NDE on these podcasts, it would help her sell her product. And so she's wanting to pitch her product. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm not infomercial here. Don't no, be using me. Say you had NDE to sell your stuff. Or they'll say, I can speak to angels and I'm going to tell you my NDE. And then you're going to believe I can speak to angels. And then you're going to send me $100 in your credit card. And I will tell you what the angels have to say. That kind of stuff. We got a lot of scams. So when people say, in the ear, say this, in the ear, say that, I'm like, careful, careful, careful. Mm. I mean, we have to do the research. We have to have the books out. We have to have the talks. We have to have this conversation. And I honestly don't understand how we're going to be able to develop any kind of ethics, any kind of guidelines, because we're just all like free falling out here. The information is just coming out, coming out. And, and people are getting to the point like uh, um, um, six minutes in heaven, uh, 10 minutes in heaven, 15 minutes in heaven. You know, like it's like, or uh, they had three NDEs. Oh, wait, now they had six NDEs. Oh, they had eight NDEs. It's getting competitive. And, yeah. and I, and I really believe some people are just making, and I know some for a fact are making up this huge, elaborate, story and everybody's rushing to hear it and it's nothing but lies and it's overshadowing all the true NDEs that are yeah, just that's, why, small, that's why I try to things. have so many vantage points that's why I try to have so many quotes from so many different NDEs from all over the world by the way they come from from New Zealand uh, and the United States Europe Africa uh, Asia anywhere uh, and, and they are from all walks of life. They they are uh, Christian, uh, Muslim, and that makes it interesting. If you if you have that's again what I try to say with the palace on the dam. If you have different points of view, you get an impression. That's the only thing you can have an impression of the real thing. You'll never be able to see what the real thing is. And then, yeah, you have to be mindful of people that that put uh, stuff in into their stories that that's what you say and i i think you're correct we should be careful we should always be careful and questioning everything i'm kind of wondering if this new stuff with the ai is going to shed any light 
into these experiences because uh, I'm hoping something will that will somehow make all the fake and and this stuff fall away to where we can really get to the meat and the truth and really scientifically philosophically psychology whatever study them in a true way yeah i, I hope that science will in, increase and advance because if you look at what quantum mechanics do they they already understand that mat matter is not really matter it can it is dependent on uh on the observation of the observer whether it's a wave or a particle and where the particle is. And they even use that now in, in quantum computers and stuff like that. So, and it, it makes uh, also the idea that time, uh, there's something strange with time. So I hope that science will go further and uh, will show that there is more than just matter, just uh, more than we think we know here. Uh, the stuff that we we learned from the Newtonian uh, uh, scientific viewpoint. There's more than that, and then maybe it will it will come closer to where spirituality comes into play. I think that's the case. I found out this morning that um, the AI now can take your podcast and tell it in all lang in all different languages in your voice and that that will be cool that say i can take my podcast do whatever they do push a button i don't know and it'll convert it all and, it, and it'll be me speaking in french and yeah. speaking in spanish and whatever yeah. and be able to send it all to those countries and what is that going to do yeah and you have to hope that it's uh, then it, it doesn't change the real um, message uh, along the yes. way because also AI can help uh, change pictures and put my face on some other other person's body and stuff like that. So and then uh, yeah, th that kind of stuff can happen as well. Wouldn't that be awful? Like it, I would think that would be a good thing, and then actually they take my voice, and I'm saying go hurt everybody or something you know yeah that it like could that. be used in a bad way Hopefully that doesn't happen but um if we uh, the, the law of mirth he says that if you can think of it it will happen so that's uh that's not very nice my deepest fear with near-death experience is that someday it will be used to make people drink the kool-aid if you know what i mean what to wear uh, it's an expression. Um, there was years ago a guy that was so religious and had all these followers and they lived this commune that he got them to line up and drink the Kool-Aid, which was poison. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, yeah. you know, that they could make near death experiences sound so wonderful. We all go either, you know, that there, there's no bad that everybody drink, you know, take your poison, whichever way it is yeah. and to go there that everybody decides that is the best route. That's kind of like where I, my fear is that near death experiences could go. I don't think so, but, and I don't hope so. Uh, I, I hope there is still a lot of people um, being genuine, especially in the ears. I, I think in the ears are, uh, will try to be genuine and will protect uh, this whole thing. Uh, yeah. Because you know, a lot of people in the comments on these will say, I want to have an NDE or I just want to go home or I lost this family member and I'm going to go with them. Or um, well, There's a reason why you're on earth, why you have your life. Uh, you have to live it. Uh, uh, love, be loved, just be an experienced life. And those things are important. You, there is a task for everyone. There's a reason why you're on earth. Uh, the moment there's no reason anymore, uh, you will be back home in, on the other side, but uh, don't speed it up, just drink it all out. Uh, that's That will be my advice. Um, and that's based on what NDEers say. And there's a lot of people that don't like, I know when I do um, interviews like this, like, okay, this is not going to get a lot of views because people will just want to hear the story. And in fact, they'll say, we'll skip to... 15 minutes, 16 seconds. That's when the NDE starts. 
they don't want to hear. And yeah. I think it's important that they hear this and that they mm. hear other things on the other videos, because I, I want, would like for people to think for yourself, you know, don't conclude this and this and this, because I say so, because they say so. Think for yourself, hear the chatter. There's the NDE they, they experienced. And then this is what they made of it. Maybe they went to a medium afterwards and the medium told them, oh, this means this and this means that. Maybe they went to an IS conference or read new age books. And so now their NDE, it means this and this. But if they went to church, you know, they're either going to tell them it didn't happen. It's uh, um, uh, the devil or something, or they're going to want them to speak in biblical terms about it. Or they're going to say this part of your NDE is not true because they don't fit the Bible. There can be so many influences on both sides and all around sides that try to get people to make something of their NDE that maybe it's not. I think so. uh, IONS conferences are wonderful places to be because you get to see so many NDEers and there's a lot of uh, talks uh, that, that give hope and give wonderful perspectives uh, of what NDEs are. I think IONS is a good organization uh, and they they... Yeah, that's what yeah, I, and I can I, see why they published your book and why, um, because you speak their language. Um, I have a different language. They, I had groups, I had an online group and two group. I started a new group and I took over a big group and they said, oh, you're a pro-life Christian. Uh, you have a choice to make that or leadership. So that's why I got my own podcast. So um, they, they w was telling people that come to groups, uh, don't say God and Jesus. Um, and then they were contacting my guests on my show once I started my show and telling them, well, the, the trans guy, I said, Scarlett, they had contacted him and said that if uh, you leave God and Jesus out of it, we'll have you in the conference. And a few others told me that they were That's contacted. What Ions does. Ions has also people that specifically talk about having seen Jesus. They have a few. Uh, in, in my book, there are also uh, quotes from people who have seen Jesus. Uh, there actually was a woman that uh, saw Jesus and then said to her, don't waste your life thinking you're not loved. Uh, everyone is loved. So well, they what... use they use near death experiences to promote abortion. Ryan's does. Yes, they no. do. Yeah, no, no. Suzanne Geisman, she's a big NDE speaker, and uh, she says that the spirits of babies, aborted babies, channel her, and they all say the same thing. And she laughs when she says it that they all want it aborted. That it's just fine. They'll be reincarnated later. And that's what they want. They did not want me being pro-life. That's, that's not the the that's not the uh, um the view. Suzanne Geisman. I know her. Uh, she is a medium, a very good medium in the United States. And She's full she of shit. Been... <laughs> well, that's what you said. She is yes. she is uh, is a uh, speech speaker on the conferences sometimes uh, when she's invited because people like her. Uh, but the yeah. views said uh, on the conference are not the, the views of IONS. IONS says we have to respect everyone. Yeah, they views. do. And, they and, do. It's a lie. And... It's a lie. They don't. Okay. They don't because they wouldn't have kicked me out for being. I mean, they told the president of IONS at the time told me it was Chuck Swedraw. He said, you have a choice to make. You're being pro-life and Christian or leadership mm -hmm. and IONS. And it's a fact. And actually, um, I finally uh, threatened a lawsuit when he started harassing my guests after they were on my show to get him away. Well, I don't know him. about these things, but I know that yeah. is very truthful and they want to uh, allow everyone their own opinion. Uh, but they, uh, uh, they make a podium for people that want to talk about their NDE and have research uh, being shown uh, in the re in the uh, conference. So that's what they do. It's not that they endorse uh, everything that people say. Uh, and in your case, what um, Suzanne Geisman said, uh, or uh, you for that matter, uh, they don't endorse anyone. They, they just... Uh, allow people to talk about their NDE. That's that's okay. the whole. We're idea. just going to agree to disagree on that because I say they have agenda. 
Okay. Uh, Robert sure. Mays, he says that he's a, a researcher. He's been with IONS forever. And in 2019 at the IONS conference, there was a vi- I think the video is still up on YouTube. Um, you could just put in Robert Mays, uh, 2019 IONS conference. And he's the one that did the uh, surveys of the indie ears to say that they had prophetic visions. And the whole thing was uh, President Trump bashing. Basically, in a nutshell, uh, if we don't get re- if Trump don't. I'm not going to say the word on YouTube, but if uh, if if uh, Trump don't leave the planet, let's say it like that, um, we won't have this like they like talking about new heaven, new earth or something. I don't know. Like we won't have this wonderful earth that we want if he's if he's an office or something. So it was all Trump bashing about the Ions conference. I don't like that so much. So it's it's um, politics and uh, talking about ions in a derogative way, I, I don't really like that so much. So maybe, um, may, maybe we can uh, agree to disagree. Of that at least, but uh, it's also like one and a half hours into the time. Yes. Okay. So thank you, and um, we've had a very good discussion. And I'll send thank this out you to you later for being on your show and. Uh, Let me know how it goes. Okay.